Once upon a time, there was a striking, remarkable church, the Central Pentecostal Tabernacle. It had two parts. First, a clean-lined modernist cube with gold and green glass, built in 1964 by Charles Lobenthal and Peter Hemingway in the international style of the Corbusier. The second, Hemingway's soaring red cedar and glass pyramid, was a model, an inspiration for all the other Edmonton pyramids to come. A truly iconic work of architecture, one that put its mark on the city. The site wasn't zoned for commercial development, but city planners upzoned the property at the church's request so that the land would be more valuable at resale. The city's Historic Resources Review Panel tried to save the buildings. They named them Historic Resources, worthy of being on an A-list. But the planning department of the day poo-pooed the idea because the tabernacle was less than 50 years old. So down the buildings came, leaving an eyesore lot that sat vacant for almost a decade. That was 10 years ago and an epiphany for me as a journalist. Tools to protect important heritage properties in Edmonton are woefully inadequate. That robs us as a city of interesting, diverse, inviting, playful buildings that robs us of our shared history. And it can make us dull and ugly, a city without texture, without narrative. In the last couple of years, we've had more luck in saving cool signature buildings in this city and in using those buildings to kickstart new commercial developments or to revitalize urban streetscapes around them. We've seen that with the Kelly Ramsey project in Rice Howard Way, a meticulous melding of old and new. We're seeing it now with a magnificent Molson Castle in the Brewery District, which has been saved through a mix of provincial, municipal, and commercial interventions, now anchoring a booming redevelopment in a too long vacant Oliver lot. And in the heart of downtown, we're seeing the work in progress at McDougal United Church, saved in the nick of time by government and community support, not just as an historic church, but as a once and future venue for the performing arts. But such efforts haven't come cheap. They've depleted the city's heritage reserve fund and cost council millions more on top of that. And often, grant alone, grants alone are not enough. The work to save, or should I say resave, the Mackay Avenue School, for example, required municipal, provincial, federal, and school board funds. That's because even though the building has long had protected status, no one was paying over the years for its basic maintenance, so we effectively had to pay to save it twice. City-supported projects can also go off the rails. Across the street, we see the restoration of the Brighton Block and the Penn Dennis Hotel. That project is flagged and failing because the community group trying to build a Ukrainian museum there simply hasn't been able to pull it off. And that, frankly, has put all the money the city invested in the project at risk and put the vulnerable buildings at risk, too. And that, in turn, has put the whole historic streetscape of the Quarters District in peril. We need new planning solutions, new ideas to save our century-old brick glories from falling. And we need strategies, too, to prevent fabulous, colorful buildings of pink marble and teal brick from being turned into things like tragically ugly beige parquet toppers. I'm still mad about this. Can you tell? Right now, the city can't designate a building against an owner's wishes without compensation. But compensation isn't based on a building's actual assessed value, but on the imagined and often, frankly, imaginary highest best use for the site. In other words, the city has to compensate an owner not just for what the site is worth, but for the lost opportunity costs of what it hypothetically could have been worth if developers actually had the zoning and financing of their fondest wishes. And frankly, that's nuts. <laughs> We need sensible rules that make it easier for the city to step in and protect buildings with fair, not fantastical compensation. And when developers or not-for-profit groups do pledge to restore buildings or rebuild facades, we can't just stop with making that a condition of a development permit. We should require developers to post letters of credit as security, a form of performance bond, so that they've got a real financial motivation to keep their word, and we've got money in hand in case they falter. We also need to make it easier for people who want to restore private heritage homes to access cash without breaking the city's bank or theirs. One idea, use the tax system as a form of credit financing so that the city effectively fronts the money for heritage repairs and then accepts loan repayment over the years in the form of higher annual property taxes. 
that might prevent more elegant mansions and more arts and craft cottages from ending up as heaps of broken brick and splintered oak. And vitally, yeah, that's my picture. That's, the, that's Sylvan Croft after it was developed. Finally, vitally, we need governments and government planners to be leaders and role models, because if they can't look after their own heritage buildings, how can we expect anyone else to? It has taken decades, but the city is finally stepping up in partnership with the TELUS World of Science to restore and redeem the lovely Queen Elizabeth II Planetarium in Coronation Park. It's such a common sense plan, it's hard to believe it took this long. But now we should insist that the province do the same and work with partners in a similar way to save the Royal Alberta Museum, a fantastic piece of public art and a centennial cultural legacy which belongs to all Albertans. 50 years after it opened, are we really so devoid of creativity and courage that we can't brainstorm a way to save it? We need planners in both the public and the private sector to offer fresh ideas and visionary leadership. We need planners and politicians who understand that buildings don't have to look like ye old English gingerbread house to be worth protecting. Otherwise, we settle for cookie cutter condos where soaring cedar pyramids once stood. We sacrifice truly original built forms for generic schlock. I hope none of you designed that one. <laughs> and we can do so much better when developers, governments, corporate partners, and planners work together to save and repurpose the really special places that give our city streets texture and joy and beauty. We need the imagination and the boldness and the determination to leverage our truly unique heritage buildings, things that give us a sense of place, in ways that give our city a fresher future. Thank you very much.